Hello and welcome to episode 280 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand More Movies You Must See Before You Die, from 1980, directed by David Lynch, starring Carl McLaughlin and Laura Dern and Dennis Hopper and Jack Nance and also Brad Dourif in a small role from 1986, also starring Isabella Rossellini. Blue Velvet, directed by David Lynch. So you should put it like a drum roll in the back. <laughs> Don't worry about that. So, Blue Velvet. This was huge for me to get Connie to watch this. Now I want to preface this with the, the fact that I'm a, a big David Lynch fan. I don't love everything he does, um, but I have definitely been drawn into his world via Twin Peaks. You know, once I became a fan of that, I started watching his other films, including Blue Velvet. And Connie has watched all of Twin Peaks. All the first two seasons, the movie, the recent season, and you enjoyed it for the most part. Um, and whenever I'd bring up Blue Velvet, you'd be like, oh no, I hate David Lynch. And I, I just could not understand why you I are don't so. I like that you're saying that I no, hate no, no, but, David but, Lynch. No, but you, you said it. You said, I don't, you know, I just, I, and I'm just like, you've never seen one of his films. You're like, I'm I sure. don't hate David Lynch. I just don't like his movies. <laughs> well, that, that's obviously what it means, you know. Okay, so I like you, Twin Peaks. Okay, so you hate David Lynch movies, but I, my argument was, don't hate you haven't Stoic. seen. You haven't seen his movies, you've seen Twin Peaks, and there's the Twin Peaks movie, of and course. And then I saw part of something that you were watching, and I was just like, nope. I don't know what it was, it's a mystery to me. It's... I don't remember what it was either, it was something with the dinner scene. I'm not going through this again on the camera. No, no, I don't know. point I don't. is that whatever little I've seen outside of Twin Peaks, I haven't enjoyed, and the ending of Twin Peaks pissed me off, and that's where okay. I drew the line. Okay. Well, I, th I think it's interesting you bring it up, because it was a real victory for me to get you to watch Blue yeah. Velvet, and it was a struggle to get you to watch Blue Velvet, so this is... Yeah, but I, we're not I'm... talking about Twin Peaks now, we're... No, 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 no. but I, I, and I'm ultimately expressing my appreciation that you did give it a shot. I think yeah. that that's something. You're welcome. Alright. Hmm. <laughs> he owes me ten movies for that movie. <laughs> Well, He's always picking the movies, and I'm like... I'm not always picking, just most of the time. 90%. So Blue Velvet, <laughs> Blue Velvet um, 1986. So this was... It, I don't know, it, it's tricky with Lynch, because you had The Elephant Man, which very much is a great film. It doesn't feel like a complete David Lynch film. There was obviously a Razorhead before that, which I previously covered and reviewed in the Epic Film Challenge too. But then he did Dune. And Dune was like this big blight on his That's career. That's one of the ones that I saw part of, I think. I don't know. I think you saw like 10 minutes and then went to bed when we lived in Surrey. I don't know. Anyway, so, so Dune is this big thing that he doesn't like to talk about. It was such a bad experience for him. And it was uh, Dino De Laurentiis who had produced that film. Almost as an apology, I think, kind of offered for Lynch to make like his passion project instead. So his next movie after Dune, which was a complete disaster on almost every level for him personally, and, you know, as a film, it didn't do well commercially or um, critically. So Blue Velvet was like the next film that he was going to get to do with more creative control. And from then on, I think pretty much David Lynch refused to do anything unless he had Final Cut and all of that sort of stuff. It might be the creativity in this movie I don't like. <laughs> wow. Okay. Right. So anyway, so Blue, so Blue Velvet. And we're going to... I like this, the story as it is, but there's some bits in there that just, nope, okay, okay. not working for me. Okay. So Blue Velvet. Um, I, I had a train of thought then, it was slightly derailed by what you just said. Oh yeah, Twin Peaks, we will get back to that in just a sec. I, I do want to mention that again. This is a story about a, a young man, played by Carl McLaughlin, called um, Jeffrey Beaumont. He's come home to kind of the small town where he's from. He uh, He's either in college or university, something to that degree. And he comes home because his father has had an accident and is in the hospital. So he's just come home to see his dad while he's kind of vulnerable and sick in the hospital. And as he's walking, I think, back from the hospital, just through this field, he finds uh, a dismembered ear in, in the grass. And he picks it up and he puts it in a little bag and takes it to the, the police station. But then he kind of, he doesn't let go of it. He wants to know more. Like, why, what was that ear? Whose ear was it? He's intrigued by it. And then he meets uh, Laura Dern's character, Sandy. And her father, I believe, does he work at the police station? Again, it's been a few weeks since we've seen it, but I'm pretty sure her father's part of the police force or something. And so he, he kind of like gets his, his, his hooks in a little bit and, and tries to get information about, you know, 
what's going on with the ear. So Sandy tells him, oh, it, it might be linked to this woman called Dorothy Valance who sings at this club. So he's like, well, let's go see her at the club and stuff. And so Jeffrey just gets drawn into this deep, spiraling circle of uh, eventually kind of breaking into this woman's apartment. He's trying to do the detective work himself, basically. Right. So this is where I think Twin Peaks plays into Blue Velvet. Um, the characters? The characters. <laughs> This is the first time David Lynch worked with Angelo Badalamenti, who's done the music on almost everything since then, including the all the yeah. So the music, it very much feels like that Twin Peaks sort yeah. of thing. Um, but then even like the, the, the some of the actors, like Jack Nance, but also obviously Carl McLaughlin, who to and me in Laura this Dern. Laura Dern, but that comes much later. But I just think the character of Jeffrey Beaumont almost feels like a template for Cooper. It almost feels like a prequel. To he's got the same awkwardness. He's got the same awkwardness, right? He he kind of is really intrigued about things. He loves the mystery, like Cooper does. You know, he's very fascinated by all this 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 weird stuff, and he gets drawn into it. And he's doing detective work along the way. But you know, I'm, I'm not saying that that's a theory or anything, or, or but it's just it makes me think of Cooper. So I kind of enjoy it on that level, although it kind of paints young Cooper as a bit of a pervert, because he eventually becomes a voyeur, and I, I don't think he he meant to. But because he was inside her apartment and she comes home and he goes into the closet and he, he's like, well, while well, I'm here, you know, and then he starts to get drawn in. But he ends up seeing something very horrible, not quite the, the kind of young, you know, male fantasy of, you know, a peep, being a peeping Tom, you know, a woman would be. I wouldn't say there's, there's very few people's fantasy to see that kind of thing. Oh, I no, wish I didn't no, see it. No, for sure. When I, when, I was a, a, when I was like a young teenager, oh, what if, what if you saw, just looked to the window and saw like a woman naked? I mean, it's just the kind of shit Oh, I'm people... talking about the scene, not her undressing. Okay, yeah, but I'm just saying, that's the kind of thing that at least young boys think about and stuff. So I'm saying it's not quite that fantasy when, when he's there in reality because it turns into something much more horrible because a man comes into the apartment and beats up and kind of rapes Dorothy. Um, in a very shocking scene, and the man is... And disturbing. And disturbing, and that's what this film Something is... Something is very, very wrong with this that This is man. a disturbing film. So this is Frank Booth, played by Dennis Hopper. And, uh, yeah, so he, he slaps around Dorothy, he gets on top of her and starts jumping up and down. And I, I'm not sure if he physically... I mean, you know, you can say what's technically rape or not, but it, it, it's just... it's bizarre. I mean, it's, it's an assault. She lets him do it, but she doesn't want it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, but I'm just saying, like, when I first watched the film and he starts jumping up and down on top of her, I thought, is that meant to be sex? Like, are we not getting that? But then I saw that he, his pants were still on, he's got this, like, breathing mask that he kind of pulls in. Like, it's very strange, very weird. And I will say, the first time I watched this film, at this point in the film, that scene, when he's jumping up and down, I thought, nah, I'm out. This is too much. Nah. I, I, so again, you're welcome. But I kept watching. I stayed. <laughs> but I kept watching, and I thought it was great. Now I will say, watching it again with Connie, I didn't enjoy it as much. Um, not by a huge amount, but just I, I can't even put my finger on why. And I have a feeling that when I watch it again, I'm going to enjoy it even more. It's just going to be like up and down. It's a very strange film. It has a lot of strength to it, but it's you know it's it's very dark and disturbing at times. So. Based on that scene where Frank Booth comes in and he attacks Dorothy, you could imagine the film going even further with that kind of stuff. And I like that it doesn't in terms of what it shows physically. I'm very, physically. very, very, very relieved that it didn't because I was thinking, right, yeah. so this is the movie now then. Like, yeah, it's going to be all sex all, scenes. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. going to just... He, he, he says mommy. Okay, so that's the thing that, that I... That's... I mean, I... I understand where he's going with it mm -hmm. because it's supposed to be disturbing and all that. But for me, those kind of scenes are just unnecessary. There's so many other things you can do to make people uncomfortable rather than that sort of scene. And that's not me being feminist or anything like no, that. No, 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 that's no, just because those kind of stuff make me uncomfortable. Yeah, it and makes for me, me it was so unnatural. So instead of me actually looking at the scene as something in a movie, I kept picturing David Lynch next to the camera. Come on, jump on her harder. Yeah, come on. Like that, you know? Anyway, it was distracting because, to me, it was totally unnatural, it, it, there was no chemistry. Even though it's supposed to be an uncomfortable scene between two people, for me there was no chemistry. There might as well, she might as well have been a doll, in my opinion, compared to him or the other way around. And it just, for me, was unnecessary. And uh, it would have been nice if it was cut out of the movie. Well, I think that... In 
given up enough much. Instead of showing all the kind of physical stuff that you could do, like with, with nudity and all that kind of stuff and sex scenes and whatever, I, I, I don't like it because it makes me uncomfortable too. I don't like it. But that kind of, the, the sexual language that he's throwing in there, it's, it's almost worse to me than seeing, you know, I don't know, more explicit graphic stuff. It's more grimy, it's more disgusting. I don't know, there's something unsettling about it. Yeah, I mean, just the way your body's moving, it's like, ugh, you know. Yeah, but it's... And it's to meant me, to make I, you uncomfortable. I didn't it's feel meant like to... I was watching the movie. At the, I understand it's meant to make you uncomfortable, but I wasn't uncomfortable with the movie. I was uncomfortable with the direction of the movie. Okay. The directing and the writing of the movie. And it pulled me out of it, and then I couldn't help thinking about why the hell would they write this? Because... It's weird enough with the mask and everything, but the, the mommy thing and the way he was acting and the way she was acting, to me, it, it didn't work. I've seen a lot of uncomfortable sex scenes and rape scenes in movies before, which made me uncomfortable in a different way because it felt real. That didn't feel real and that's why I didn't like it. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. You may continue. <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel that way about it. I think, it, for me, it works in the story, but I can understand that viewpoint. I think you expressed it quite well. Um, okay, so, well, moving forward from that then, was, did you feel the same way throughout the entire film about Frank Booth Not and like Dorothy? Not like I said. I've, I'm glad that they didn't keep the same theme yeah. throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah, there were some weird bits that were strange for me, where I was just like, why is he just stood like that? Because he goes into the apartment again and... This guy's just stood there where that guy's tied to the chair or whatever. And he's just stood there looking and he doesn't even see when he comes in. You mean at the end? Okay, just want to cut in and say that we do st start talking about spoilers randomly. So just consider this a spoiler filled video. There we go. You mean at the end? Yeah. He's dead. No, he was stood. You mean the guy in the jacket? Who wasn't wearing jackets? How can you... The guy in a jacket? That doesn't say okay, anything. So he got shot after, and then he died. Okay. Before he got shot, he was just stood there. Straight up. If he was dead, that makes it even worse, Luke. Because you can't fucking stand like that when you're do, dead. Do you mean like at the very end when Jeffrey he goes He stood the... right next to the TV, and then there was one guy who sat in a chair. And he was dead. Yeah, the guy in the chair, fine. Because he was sat in a chair. Yeah, the guy standing up was dead. Like, he, he, his head was like... It was like head trauma. Like, okay, why was he standing then? I don't know. It was okay. just like, it... I dislike the movie even more now. Thank you for that. <laughs> Stupid. I'm fairly certain that guy's Last standing... Last time I checked, when you die, your muscles don't work no uh, okay, more and you so, can't so, stand. So here's the thing. With, 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 There's no thing. With, it's just become unnatural now. Yeah, Lynch plays into the unnatural. It's There are these things the that happen that... The rest of the that... movie wasn't. And then you have one dead guy standing <laughs> with, with his brains blown out. I'm pretty sure, yeah, that, that guy was... Well, he got shot again after, and that's when he died. He was stood there looking at the guy in the, in the chair. He wasn't, he was just, he was just stood there. Holding just like... a gun, wasn't he? Yeah, then Jeffrey took the gun, but he, w he wasn't moving, he was dead. So dead, and he still managed to, to grip a gun. Okay, maybe he wasn't dead, but he was just like... I don't know, like... Just leave it. I, I, how can you look it up? Okay, so it says he discovers the husband dead and the yellow man mortally wounded. So I guess maybe he wasn't dead on his feet, but he was like shot in the head and like pretty much dead. Like just about wounded. to die. Wounded. Yeah. Okay, so some kind of shock then. I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see the head shot on him. Yeah, anyway, right, so... So weirdness and all of that. Um, That's more acceptable anyway than him standing there dead. Okay. All right. Well, this is my mistake for reading into it that he was dead. But to me, it just the things Lynch, the things that Lynch does in films doesn't necessarily need to adhere to logic. Sometimes I don't know. It's it, the his storytelling is more like how it makes you feel than how it makes you think about. Well, how could that happen? I don't know. I, I feel like he he operates on a different level than. And I'm the wrong kind of viewer. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But you gave it a shot. You gave it a shot. So, you know, Jeffrey... I was just saying, I, I liked most of the movie. It was just some of the scenes were stupid. Okay, so what did you what, what did you like? Overall, I, 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 I actually thought the movie was alright. Mm -hmm. Overall. What, what parts but... did you like then? The rest of it. 
the rest of it. Okay. Well, I like when it's sneaking in and stuff like that, and you know, trying not to and, get caught. Yeah. That kind of tension. That's it, actually. That's all I liked. <laughs> didn't like the singing one bit. Wish I didn't hear that twice. What of, of the her singing? Her singing Blue yeah. Velvet. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. We talked about that. Yeah. It wasn't good. Yeah, she um, Isabella Rossellini wasn't very distracted. Wasn't confident in her own singing, and so they had to work work the song out. And actually, I think that that she learnt the wrong version of the song that Lynch wanted, and so it had to be changed again, and so on. Uh, I don't mind it. I I think it you know it's, it sounds fine yeah, to me. Yeah, but you don't have the same. I I don't have the same no. Hearing the same that hearing. That <laughs> Connie's very particular about singing and stuff like that. False note. False note. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, 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 mainly I just like to trying to sneak in and the investigation. The part investigation of things aspect of the film. And the okay. tension. Yeah. Other than that, it, it was just a movie, and then it had a couple of that main scene that I hated. Mm. So at some point, I'm probably going to do my own kind of like in-depth review of the film. There's lots I like to talk about, but I think that going into all that now is probably not the most, you know, it would be the most enjoyable thing for Connie, which is understandable. But you know, we'll What's important is I didn't hate the movie. Yeah. And you gave it a shot. Yeah. So shot. I, I was surprised by my non-hatred of it. I, I, I really get drawn in by the, the scene where um, the guy, I think Ben is, is the character's name, Dean Stockwell. Um is singing or miming to the song, um, oh, what is the song? In Dreams, right? So this this kind of like old, it sounds like an old 50s song, I don't know if it is, but he starts like singing but miming this song with like a, a lamp and he's using the lamp as a microphone and Frank Booth is like just standing there watching him and kind of like really intensely like no mouthing along to it and it's just like it's just this really kind of intense sequence when does that happen it's like one of the main secrets it's when it's when um jeffrey goes to dorothy to her apartment and then frank turns up and he's like oh, who's this and then we're, yeah. we're gonna go for a ride and they take him to this place and there's weird people in the background and then he's like you know sing that song for me so he puts the tape in and he gets this is it after he's holding up that woman who's walking out i can't remember because that's when he goes to her place isn't it i don't remember that I don't know. Why do I not remember that weird scene? That sounds maybe maybe I'm trying to not remember it because I didn't like it. I don't know, but he but so you know this guy's like miming it and stuff, and then Frank is looking at it. And he's just kind of like he's, you don't know if he's hating it or loving it, and his face is like all. And then he just gets him to stop, and it's like what's going on? And then he starts quoting this song later on again, and you know, and then later in the bar you see him watching Dorothy and he's like holding this piece of blue cloth and he's just like, you know, really like moved by everything. So he's just a very weird character. But that in dreams scene was is just very striking. I don't know, it's just the the fact that he's not singing, he's miming along to it and Frank is so transfixed by it. It's uh <laughs> you're so lost. I can't remember. No fucking that. Well, I have seen the film twice, so I guess yeah. I, I have more of a memory on it and that is a I must have just really not liked it or something. And, and I just thought like, oh, this isn't a stupid scene and then maybe drifted away. I don't know. And, and it stands out to me because a friend of mine in work once um, in the freezer where I work, there's these like light strips at the top and one of them was like hanging off and he just went, hey, Luke. And he just pulled off the strip and went, a candy color clown, they call the sun. And he just started singing in dreams. It was like, the, so it really sticks in my mind. But I think outside That's of that, why. outside of that, it is a very memorable sequence, I think. But I, it's just, it's, I know Frank Booth is a really interesting character. Memorable. Obviously, obviously <laughs> what? Well, memorable, memorable, because I don't remember. Oh, right. Well, yeah. for, uh -huh. for me it is, right. Um, and I think others would agree. But he, I don't know, there's, there's something about that character that's very unsettling and intriguing. And obviously the stuff, the sexual stuff of it, it makes you think about it. He must have had a really fucked up childhood. Dorothy, too, in terms of her psychology and how she is like asking Jeffrey to hit her when they eventually start becoming sexually involved. And he doesn't really want to do it. I think I remember Carl McLaughlin saying in some interview he, he was really uncomfortable with going to that place because he just it was very, you know... Like, like the character would feel he didn't really want to do it but he's he has the opportunity to sleep with a, a beautiful woman and stuff uh, and then there's the whole relationship with sandy this kind of like perfect picturesque girl next door type and how he's like stealing her away from her boyfriend you know? and then he's also having this affair with this older woman so lots going on and this was a strange film behind the scenes because a lot of love was found in the making of the film carl mclaughlin and laura dern got together as their characters do in the movie uh, Isab Isabella Rossellini and David Lynch 
got together and fell in love during the making of this film. So lots came from it personally. And uh, critically, it was received very well and kind of paved the way for a lot more of his career, I think. And then Twin Peaks followed not too far after that. I'm trying to think if he made a film before Twin Peaks. I don't think so. I think Wild at Heart came after the first season of Twin Peaks, I think. I'm not sure. So Blue Velvet, I, I do think it's a great film. As I said, I didn't enjoy it as much this time around for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it was just conscious of you and not knowing whether you enjoyed it that maybe I didn't fully focus on it. I don't know. You knew it was a yeah. risk, me watching A risk, it. yeah. But, um, you know, even like the opening scene where it's like this, the picturesque American suburbia and, you know, just like these picket fences and the bright flowers and then the camera just goes underneath the ground and it's just the bugs. And it's, you know, it's a bit on the nose really, but it's, you know, it's, it's just showing you that, you know, Anything could be going on in your neighborhood just around the around the corner in some strange apartment with a guy with a breathing mask, you know, going fucking yeah, crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't have to repeat that. Yeah. Um, and Dennis Hopper, who plays Frank Booth, was in a really tricky spot when making this film because he was fucking mental. People didn't want to work with him because he was on drugs and crazy and all this stuff. And then he got sober, he got clean, and it, it was difficult for people to say, well, I don't really want to work with him. And so they had to say, no, he's, he's sober again. But of course, he's coming in during the beginning stages of his sobriety, playing this guy who's whacked out on drugs and stuff. So it's, you know, it's a very touchy one. Apparently, he called up David Lynch and said, um, I am Frank Booth. And Lynch thought, this is great, but it's also really worrying. <laughs> but yeah, it worked out fine for the film itself. Uh, I don't know whether to laugh or be horrified towards the end when Dorothy turns up completely naked in the streets and Jeffrey brings her back to Sandy's house. And so he's there with this girl who he's sweet on Sandy. And then he's got this naked woman clutching onto him. And she says, he put it, he put his disease in me. <laughs> it's just like, Oh my God. Which, and that is based on a, a true story. Not the whole part with, you know, that part where he takes him to the, the house. But when Lynch was a kid, very young, just out of the darkness in the street, a naked woman just started walking up. And all he knew, he said, I think he said when he was a kid, all I knew was that something very wrong had gone on there and I didn't know what to do. And it was you know, very strange. And so he draws on these very bizarre things and puts them in the film and it makes it, for me, memorable. <laughs> Not in good ways sometimes, but um, yeah, I, I feel like I could do a lot better summarizing this film and talking about it. But for the, the sake of this, I guess all we need to really do at the end of the day is say, is it a film you should see before you die? No. Mm. Not in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say... It's tricky. I think the, the three Lynch films in the book that I've been working off the past seven years are A Razor Head, Elephant Man, and Blue Velvet. I would... I would say... How do I put it? I would swap Blue Velvet for Mulholland Drive, I think. I think Mulholland Drive is, is a better film. But I still really like Blue Velvet. There's something something just... I don't know. It's, it's a weird film. I like its weirdness because it's different. It doesn't feel like anything else I've seen. There isn't David Lynch. I mean, it feels Lynchy. It feels Twin Peaksy at times. It feels its own thing at times, too. And I think Isabella Rossellini does a really good job with the character where she has to kind of... Or a role where she has to be very naked at times and you know i don't know it's quite a soul-bearing role to take on and uh, she was the daughter of um, ingrid bergman which is interesting because I, I kept thinking like i've seen her before somewhere and then i realized i've seen her in casablanca and it was her mother you know mm. like she just has she's very distinctively looks like her mother and um and she i think she was advised not to do the film because people would think that she was just trying to break away from that you know from her family in a way by doing something so shocking but uh she committed to it, and I think it makes the film better. Carl McLaughlin, I think, is a little unrefined here. I don't think he's that... He's a bit creepy at times, you know? Like, when he's, like, trying to woo Sandy. I don't know. I forget the exact line, but, like, there's certain... I feel certain... like he's a child version of himself. <laughs> yeah. He's well, bit... he, he's just stood there, you know, and like a deer in headlights, and he A little seems... bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he seems like he hasn't found himself yet. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. And then, and that's like not the, that he's like bad acting or anything. No, like no, that no, no, it. no. It's no. just that it's not him yet. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean. it, it's just it's maybe that that it's works. Like some kind of sense of insecurity or something. Yeah, maybe that works for for the character. I love the the shot when you first see Sandy walking out of the darkness and the music is very you know 
I don't know, there's something about that shot and moment that's really great. And then, yeah, so there's lots of things I like about the film. Uh, I think it is a film you should see before you die because based on some of the other films in the book, I think this flattens them in terms of, like, you know, memorable moments and a, a, a film experience that you get something out of and you get a lot of just, I don't know, it's unsettling, it's dreamy and um, different. Or and nightmarish. Nightmarish, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, dreamy and nightmarish in, in different measures. Um and I like Sandy's speech about the, um, I forget the birds now, that's going to bother me. This is a particular bird that she talks about, but it's a, I can't even remember the line, but it's a very nice, dreamy moment in a nightmarish film. So we'll leave it there. That's Blue Velvet. Well done. Um, you, 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 know, you get, you get your, your stripes for enduring a David Lynch film. <laughs> now now it's going to be like a should have a medal now it's going to be like Everest to get you to watch another one like Mulholland Drive is one I'd like to see you watch but yeah there's I wouldn't say that I'd say Blue Velvet is a lot more uncomfortable than Mulholland Drive I wouldn't even say Mulholland Drive is uncomfortable but there's definitely elements of it where you already I, said but... there's, there's a couple of things I think you wouldn't like and th but yeah, I think overall I don't know that'd be intriguing but it's not in the book so it is what it is so Blue Velvet that's about it yeah. So thank you for watching and uh, see you in the next one.